Hello, and welcome back to module four. This is a video two of modeling analysis, where we will pick up where we left off and start to discuss how to use a, an optimal model to start to predict new reaction components, uh, extrapolate new reaction types, as well as start to think about how to deconstruct a model to gain some mechanistic insight into the reactions we're setting. So looking back at the optimal model we found for the bifunctional hydrogen bond donor catalysis uh, case study. We now want to use that model to extrapolate to some new reaction space, uh, new reaction components. Um, in this case, for this module, we'll use new catalyst structures for an example. And I'll note here that when trying to extrapolate to uh, new reaction components and um, running these predictions, it's really imperative that you use data sets that the model has never seen before. Um, this is so you don't introduce any um, unwanted bias um, and that you actually get a true sense of your model's predictive capability. So data sets we, we will, I will introduce here will be completely unknown to the model um, and we're not used in the model uh, development process whatsoever. So looking at this hydroxyl feature thiurea catalyst, um, we using it as a validation set we get a predicted R squared of 0 0.7 over nine examples, which is a pretty good prediction relative to our model's fit. But if we wanna think about a different way to express um, prediction error, we can think of just using average delta delta G error, which is equal to the uh, absolute value of the predicted delta delta G minus the measured delta delta G over the number of examples you have in your data set. So looking at the same example, uh, we see we have an average prediction error of 0 0.21 kcal per mole, which uh, equates approximately about 5% EE uh, in this case. So this is a good example of whether you use R squared or average prediction error. In either way, the metric uh, is representative of a good prediction uh, or low error in this case. We switch to another um, example, this Jacobson type um, diarrhea catalyst, uh, using it as a validation set we get a predict R squared of 0 0.4, which is significantly worse than the last uh, example and would be considered a, a a poor prediction, a poor prediction, I should say. But knowing that R squared can be influenced by data set size and distribution, as well as uh, outliers can have a really detrimental effect in R squared. Looking at the other metric, average prediction error, we see it's only 0 0.33 kcal per mole. And given the EE percent distribution of this data set, it actually only equates to about three to 5% EE error, which is a pretty good prediction. So this is a good example of when we have to think about the metric we're using to judge and evaluate um, our predictive capability. So in this case, if, although a few outliers um, made the R squared quite worse, um, overall the model is actually able to uh, do a nice job of um, predicting the general trend of this reaction and the new reaction components. Another really um, useful tool you can use is virtual screening. Especially if you have, uh, if you're setting one specific reaction and you're kind of stalled out um, in the 70 and 80% EE range and you want to get to a more selective reaction, you can change and screen computationally uh, steric and electronic changes to catalysts or reaction components and screen these computationally. And it's really a nice, uh, helpful tool to kind of guide your lab experiments in a way to validate your computational uh, predictions. So now that we've kind of touched on, how to use a model to uh, get some predictive um, output. We can now think about how to use a model to gain some mechanistic uh, insight into our reactions we're studying. So looking back at this optimal model, um, we see, like I showed before, we have four cows parameters, two nucleophile parameters, one electrophile parameter, one solvent parameter. So in this example, in this case study, it really helped us to look at the proposed emission state, uh, which is pretty universal for these um, types of the reactions where you see the dual activation of the nucleophile and nucleophile, the electrophile and nucleophile by the um, hydrogen bond donor catalyst. And it was shown in literature that the um, hydrogen bond donor portion, the PKA of these catalysts uh, correlated with selectivity. So we, th we thought that would be a good place to start. So looking at the MB, especially since the MBOH of our model um, is, is in our model, um, this proton here, we thought maybe it had some, uh, it would have some correlation with PKA. Although there is no direct correlation with the PKA, we saw that the PKA of these catalysts did have a really strong correlation with the lumo of our catalysts. Um, so this is kind of a 
good example of, although it's not directly correlated to one of our uh, models parameters, it's very correlative to one of the other parameters we um, grabbed in our, um, of our reaction component. And it's kind of makes sense if you look back at this resistance state um, as a PKA and the LUMO, the LUMO of the uh, catalyst um, while the uh, nitro alkene is donating into that lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So this kind of intuitively makes sense it made sense to us as why that would be uh, so highly correlated. So now looking at the LUMO of all our catalysts, um, we tried to compare it to the MBOH, of, which was the parameter that was in our model. And although we couldn't uh, find a direct correlation between them, it was kind of a qualitative correlation which appeared, um, but there seemed to be some another steric classification or some other, um, uh, cl some other um, classification that prevented us from direct correlation. But so one of the kind of cool things we can do, uh, we can actually swap out um, delta delta G and use the LUMO as our output. So we can now use, you know, we can use parameters of different reaction components as output. So using the LUMO of our catalyst as an output, we can uh, run forward stepwise uh, linear regression and we can find, and we found a very correlative model, which actually contained the MBOH of our catalyst, as well as a kind of a, a steric type um, uh, parameter as well, as well as an NMR of the, hydrogen bond donor catalyst. So it shows that the MBOH, which is in our global model, is actually quite a useful model in showing um, correlation to the LUMO. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, shows how the MBOH is playing, not only kind of uh, representing the PKA of our catalyst, but also um, a slight steric um, uh, contribution as well. So now we've kind of covered a, a kind of a quick example of how you could start to think about how to deconstruct your model and try to think about different trends and different ways to look at uh, comparisons between parameters of uh, the kind of things you're interested in. A few other notes that I like to touch on is now that you kind of have a good sense of the modeling process, you can now understand how cross terms may complicate the interpretation of these kind of complex models, especially when we have six to eight parameters. If you have a cross term, it, it's really hard to, when it comes to interpretation, really hard to try to um, understand what contribution each of those terms is really um, representing. Um, and furthermore, if you have that cross term that shows that if you have a good model that contains a cross term, maybe there's a more effective parameter that exists that um, you can develop that would actually take the place of the cross term and be a more robust uh, parameter to use. To use. As well as um, another thing to touch on is uh, the whole, this whole like kind of uh, interpretation and prediction is really dependent on your overall modeling goals. So when you're picking models and you're thinking about we should have cross terms of the parameters you're having, I mean, it really comes down to what your modeling goals are, whether you want a really predictive model um, that you're not very interested in interpretation, or if you're purely interested in mechanistic interpretation, this would kind of ha kind of guide you in how to, pick your models and comparing one model over another. Um, as our group is quite interested in mechanistic interpretation, um, this typically uh, is, um, is one of the factors we consider when um, choosing a model. And then furthermore, kind of in the same uh, sense as cross terms, collinearity between independent parameters also kind of causes issues in, in interpretation just because the independent uh, relationship with delta delta G is quite diluted since you have such an overlapping um, uh, space that you're covering with two different parameters when it comes to interpretation, trying to understand the role of those individual parameters becomes quite difficult. So that's the uh, end of module four, um, kind of the overall uh, work, the overall MLR workflow um, allows us for simultaneous correlation, multiple properties. And it's kind of the modeling process I showed you and what our overall goal is using this workflow. And it's nice because we are able to um, analyze varied systems in contrast to transition state analysis where you're typically um, uh, limited to kind of one uh, ligand or one catalyst and one specific reaction uh, component combination. We're able to actually analyze uh, many different uh, uh, systems without you know, running up the computational cost. Furthermore, um, like we, I've shown, uh, model development can lead to very me meaningful mechanistic insight. Um, and that's throughout a lot of our group's uh, history of papers. Um, like I mentioned, it's kind of an overarching goal of our group is to look for uh, meaningful mechanistic details of our models. Um, uh, and the application of these models can also be used for the prediction and reaction components. Uh, and this can be kind of a quite powerful tool and people can, it can also be very useful in 
further reaction development uh, for other people to use. And I think just as a, a ending kind of comment, I think, as I mentioned before, it's really important to acknowledge your over overall modeling goals um, when kind of going through this process and developing your models. Um, it's really important to kind of think about what your overall end goal is. Do you just want a really predictive model that can be used to, for, mo for reaction development or do you want something that can really um, find some useful mechanistic insight between different reactions, different, mechanis different mechanisms of reactions um, or both, which is of course ideal. But um, I think just going in with a, a set goal is really important sometimes. And then finally is just a list of references, which I encourage you to um, check out, kind of brushed over uh, the over the topics of these papers throughout the module. Um, but this would be really good. Uh, good references to check out and learn more, gain a more fundamental understanding of data science in general, as well as the way we use data science tools in the Sigma group. Um, so yeah, thanks for checking. Thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I hope you are successful in your future uh, modeling uh, goals. Thanks.